Here's Johnny. To tell you the truth, I was halfway home and I heard the applause. I made a U-turn on the freeway and came back. I said, there must be a show on. What the hell is going on tonight? Not at all, I see. Getting cranked up for the big game tomorrow. USC Notre Dame out here. That should be a great game. He's on in a great mood. I have, a, I have an idea. Why don't you, uh, I've got an extra toothbrush. Why don't you stay over? You'll never get a cab at this hour. <laughs> Remember those moves? <coughs> See, I'll... Sure, now that you got it all in your system, you want a show, don't you? Uh, you'll have to excuse the monologue tonight. It's the day after Thanksgiving, and all I have are leftover jokes. <laughs> that, was, that was one of them. <laughs> we want to pass that down here, whatever you're smoking. I'd like a little... I understand six turkeys yesterday did get away unscathed, though. They were stopped at the border. They had passports, had wearing rubber noses and glasses. <laughs> you know, this year it seemed different than Thanksgiving last year. Yeah. Last year it was plop, plop, fizz, fizz, and this year it was... That was the sound of the American dollar, going plop, plop, fizz, fizz. <laughs> there was a joke there. I lost it somewhere on... <laughs> the economy is still a serious problem in the paper. That's all you read about. Pick up the paper today, and uh, according to the Wall Street Journal, a man was standing on the... Uh, 40th floor of a building, a ledge back in New York City. Crowd was out there. He's threatening to jump. And a guy looked up, and one of the crowd, guy in the crowd says, my broker is E.F. Hutton, and if E.F. Hutton says jump. I'd have been with that guy. I thought I'd gone deaf for a moment. I came, came to the end of it. I said, my God, it struck me deaf. Well, anyway, we got some. The Christmas season now traditionally is here. The day after Thanksgiving, we are now in the Christmas season. It's a little commercial. It starts a little too early. The networks are planning all their specials. You know they have one coming up, a musical special for Christmas called Gladys Knight and the Three Wise Pips? <laughs> they are running out of ideas for Christmas specials. One network is doing a special called Charlie Brown Kills Santa Claus. <laughs> yeah, for that, yeah. <laughs> I just want to look at you and see how you look. And tomorrow's a good day. Two football games tomorrow. There are about three on Sunday. Then there's Monday night football. Uh, this, this country is football crazy. I thought it was even in bad taste today when the Highway Safety Council predicted this weekend a death toll of 400 with a point spread of 36. <laughs> Did you read about Stephen Ford in the paper? Did you, you see that article? Yeah, they're, they're, people love to write books and articles on things that went on in the White House. And according to Betty Ford's press secretary, it seems that during the time that President Ford was president, <laughs> Steve Ford, not I was going to say Jack, but it was Steve Ford, apparently had a date in the White House. And she stayed overnight in one of the bedrooms. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and Steve Ford woke up the next morning and peeks out the door, and Barbara Walters and a TV camera crew were there. It was in the paper today, going on a White House tour. 
But I understand Barbara was very discreet. She climbed between the couple and said, Now, tell me exactly how you felt. Uh, Barbara was nice. Who's that? Actually, President Ford was not in the White House at the time. He was holding a high-level cabinet meeting down the street at a Ramada Inn. <laughs> Well, what else happened today? Not much. You know what is a big success in Japan? It was on front page of the paper today. McDonald's has moved into Japan. They opened the 5,000th McDonald's around the world, the 147th one in Japan. And over there, you get a hambaga, they call it, H-A-M-B-A-G-A, for 79 cents, and a big maca. <laughs> That's what they say. A big, a big maca is $1.79. Isn't that nice? Got 147 McDonald's in Japan. I knew we'd get even for Pearl Harbor. <laughs> they also have a Jack in the box over there, but you drive up and Jack snaps your picture. <laughs> Weird. I don't know, I can't imagine McDonald's in Japan. Can't you see the waiters in there saying, telling customers to keep an eye on their flies? <laughs> I'll tell you what's on the other channel tonight. Merv Griffin has got another theme show that only Merv does with such great panache. Uh, tonight, Merv is having uh, Teddy Kennedy, Gerald Ford, uh, Jerry Brown, and Mork. <laughs> They're all going to discuss the art of double talk. That's a... Okay, I don't want to keep you too long because we've, a... we've got a good show tonight. A good friend of mine, Jimmy Garner, is here. And, uh... We have Miss... A fine actress. Miss Ellen Burstyn is with us. We have David Letterman. And Rob Dornsife is with us. We'll tell you how to avoid getting a traffic ticket or what to do after you get one. So thanks for coming. We'll be with you here. We'll be right back. Oh, sure. We have uh, Jimmy Garner with us tonight, Ellen Burstyn, David Letterman. And uh, David Letterman is a young man who was uh, on the Mary Tyler uh, Moore variety show. Very clever young man. And Rod Dornsife is a former uh, motorcycle traffic officer who was with San Diego for about five years. He wrote a book on called The Ticket Book. You ever got a ticket? Oh, yes. <laughs> for what? Um, uh, speeding and speeding. that type of thing. And I, I must say, you know, I think when you get one that you deserve, you should take it gracefully and take it as a warning and a chance to... They're trying to do you a favor, I think. Oh, you... They must be after you. <laughs> uh, have you done something we don't know about? <laughs> no, but I was thinking I might. <laughs> Isn't that an awful feeling when you're driving along you, and you look back and you see the red lights going and you know... That it's for you? Oh, I got nailed for one in New York once. It was the worst thing. On 49th Street, you know, they, they had a police slowdown, and they were looking to get rid of some tickets. Oh, you and I, sure. And I was driving, I had the, the mustache, and all driving a, a sports car, and a cop pulled me over, and he walked around a car for 15 minutes before he could find something that he thought was wrong. F. Lee Bailey was going to defend the case. Well, what were you doing? I was just sitting there waiting for the light to change. In the meantime... Well, you see, you look suspicious. Guys with mustaches are always in trouble. Wait a minute! Guys with mustaches just because, generally look shifty. Just because I had on my raincoat and a box of Hershey bars in the car doesn't mean anything. <laughs> I got stopped, was and speaking of New York, I was driving up uh, to upstate New York, and I look back, and there are the, the oh, and the siren, and I said, I don't know what the hell I was doing, and I pull over, and the guy gets out, true, and he comes up, and he says, Johnny Carson, right? <laughs> and I said, right, and he, he has an autograph book. <laughs> And he says, you know, I got Derwood Kirby yesterday. <laughs> True story. And I said, you're scaring people to death out here. Because when you see those red lights, you want to go, you don't know whether to, what they're after you for. And all he wants want an autograph. All right, just, just, incidentally, yesterday, as you know, was Thanksgiving. And we missed observing a very important birthday. I wonder how many of you knew whose birthday it was yesterday. Franklin Pierce. Oh, darn it. Son of a <laughs> Franklin Pierce was the 14th president of the United States. 
I'll take your word for it. Well, he's not known. <laughs> See, he's not known. The only reason that Pierce became president, he looked so good after Fillmore. <laughs> Newt Fillmore. Fillmore. Yeah. Anyway, I just thought I'd mention that. Okay. Well, Come that's in. the kind of stuff that these people are here. You know, it keeps, keeps things alive. I mean... I mean, you know, it, it isn't all just, just uh, beer and Skittles and laughter here. We got to give these folks some information, too. Right. Smart outfit. <laughs> if you're going to war. As you know, this has not been the best TV season in history. Uh, it's a tough competitive business. A lot of shows go on and they get knocked off after a few weeks. And all of the networks already are planning for what they call, I guess it used to be called the second season, but now they're called mid-season replacements for shows that didn't make it. I'm going to give you some of the shows coming up. These are NBC, by the way. Uh, there's a show coming up called Cliffhanger. Now, this is it. Remember the old serials? And you'd go to Saturday and you'd see the serial. Well, this is a television version of the serials that a lot of us saw on Saturday afternoon. They have a 60-minute segment. We'll feature three Cliffhanger serials, which will hopefully encourage viewers to tune in the following week to find out what happened. Here's a new show called The Love Song of Fred and Carrie. I'm not making these up. This is about a white widow and a black widower, both in their 50s, who meet, fall in love, and then have to contend with the reaction of his son and daughter and his son. Uh, there's one called The Duke, private eye series with Robert Conrad that's in the works. Bonnie and Frankie. <laughs> I love the cute titles, Bonnie and Frankie. A situation comedy about a pair of women undercover cops. Brothers and sisters. Now, what do you think this is based on? A comedy about shenanigans taking place in a campus sorority house and fraternity house. Mm. Because of Animal House, right? Hospital Stay, a comedy about a feisty old nurse and her daughter, who both work in the same hospital. IFR, which stands for Institute for Retaliation. This is a quasi-governmental organization with unlimited funds dedicated to helping legitimate victims get revenge on their victimizers. <laughs> Folks, I mean, this is what's going on in our world. There's one called Wayward Girls. <laughs> now, I certainly that hope That sounds so. good. I like Yes, that. a comedy set in Miss Wayward's School for Girls. Mm. Oh, now that... I didn't get that. Miss Wayward's is the lady who runs it. <laughs> <laughs> You see how cute they are? Wayward, a comedy set in Miss Wayward's School for Girls. With the girls a bunch of mischievous juvenile delinquents. And with a headmaster, a former assistant warden at Sing Sing. Now, folks, this is the high caliber of network thinking. Uh, those are a few of the pilots you will see. And of course, for everyone that gets on the air, there are probably 40 or 50 that do not make it. Our staff checked into some of those. <laughs> that did not make it. You will not see, but luckily we managed to get some still pictures taken during rehearsal. And if you watch the monitor, we'll tell you about some of the pilots that didn't make it. Here's one called Laverne in the Icebox. It's, about, it's a comedy about a girl from Milwaukee whose roommate is a frost-free refrigerator. And Laverne is unable to get dates because both she and her roommate are frigid. This is one that didn't get on. Okay. Didn't make it, folks. Here's another one that I kind of like. This is a uh, wide world of sports special called the Pinto 500. <laughs> now, yeah. now, they don't race. You don't understand. They don't race. They, the drivers sit in parked Pintos. <laughs> and the winner is the person who can be scattered into the most outlying suburbs. <laughs> Didn't get on. This is an anthology series called Weirdest Crimes of the Century. Here you see master criminal Ivan Dimsley, whose weird crime is sneaking up on unsuspecting female farmers and backing into their pitchforks. <laughs> Didn't make it. <laughs> Here's a new show called Fantasy Barbershop. <laughs> where you go and let your follicles live out their fantasies. Here you see, here you see a man whose fantasy was to see his mustache sucked up through his brain. <laughs> Didn't get on. There's one called Love Barge. Obviously a takeoff and a successful show. Here we see first mate Bob receiving news that he has caught a venereal disease from a deck chair. <laughs> Here's a supernatural series, The Next Psychic. This is about a fortune teller who can predict the future by staring not into a crystal ball, but into an old man's goiter. <laughs> well, you see, that's why I didn't make it, folks. 
From the producers of the TV series Flying High comes a new show, Flying Low. <laughs> this is a comedy about a trio of happy-go-lucky airline stewardesses and their devil-may-care pilot who fly illegal drugs out of Columbia. <laughs> and in this scene, you've seen them as they ruin the happy hour at the airport bar. <laughs> Didn't make it. Here's a new cooking program called Cannibal Chef. <laughs> right here, you see the cook Livingston preparing skull stew. That was on the first episode, and they didn't want that on. These sound better than the ones they have. You remember the uh, wonderful motion picture, Lassie Come Homes? This is a remake called Fido Go Away. <laughs> this is the story of a slow-learning German shepherd who insists his master is a tree. <laughs> so it's never been a show called Nazi Taxi. Here, Fritz waits outside a grenade festival to take General Schmidt back for a helmet fitting. Fortunately, that one didn't make A Western series about a Dodge City proctologist <laughs> who becomes the fastest glove in town. We don't, we don't have a title for that yet. New story called Cat House. <laughs> story of a female lion who runs a brothel in Central Africa. So far, the only customers have been Marlon Perkins and his assistant. <laughs> and a new show called Where's My Office? <laughs> this is the... This is the... Uh, this is the... Uh, it's the story of a man who continually sets up a desk in a field hoping someone will build a wall around him so he can hang up his mementos. That's, uh, those are just a few of the pilots that didn't get on. <laughs> okay, tonight we have... We have James Garner with us, Ellen Burson, David Letterman, and Rod Dornsythe. We'll do that right after this brief, as they say. We are back. My first guest tonight. That Tom. He's a gentleman you all know. He's a fine actor and finally got recognized for his excellent work last year by winning an Emmy for The Rockford Files, which is on NBC Friday nights at 9 o'clock. Would you welcome Jim Garner? We don't, uh, we don't let anything, we spare no expense here. Oh, I noticed that. Oh, I, I want to uh, say something. Uh, sure. I really uh, enjoyed being at your 20th anniversary party. Yeah, we had a little do. Really, really nice. The uh, Ed's wife and my wife, Joanna, threw a surprise party for us, and that's not easy to pull off for her. Ed and I started on a show called Who Do You Trust back in New York, and then 16 years on this show, we had a 20th anniversary. We walked in Chasen's. I thought it was a political rally. She said that I think at that time it was for Carrie Peck. She says, won't you drop in and say hello? And we walk in, I, and I saw you, and I saw a lot of people, and I still didn't get wise because those are the kind of, you were the kind of people who might be at a rally. All of a sudden we found out, well, you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Stars of your ilk or stature could have been associated with that. Well, I had a pleasant time. Did you really? <laughs> a pleasant time? Oh, it was a pleasant evening. You fine. saw Lamas the other night, didn't you? <laughs> Lamas was here talking about the party, and I said, did I you have a good time? And, he's, table, and he said, yes, it was a pleasant party. <laughs> I said, what do you mean pleasant? That's, that sounds like a cop-out. I said, wasn't it a great party? Fernando says, no, it was a pleasant party. It was nothing. It was a pleasant party. I was sitting at the same table with Fernando. <laughs> you were. <laughs> and you. Yeah, it was, was a pleasant party. Everybody. You don't go out often. I, I don't see you out I around town. Where, where do you hide out? Home. Do you really? Yeah. I go out, oh... Are you... Would you can just really yourself as a, a year. as a loner? My wife thinks so. Yeah? Does she uh, want yeah, to... Yeah, I, I guess I am a loner. Uh, Does she want I... to go out more often? Oh, yes. Uh, what do you say? How do you get I away say with go. <laughs> Let her go. No, come on now. No, I really... I, I, w I work too much to, to go out. I really do. Uh, yeah. When I get home in a week, I can hardly walk by the Friday oh, night, you know. <laughs> really. No, what, what's a typical night at home for you? <laughs> You don't have to go into it. You, you really, you, you really want to hear it? I think these people would I'll like to know. you a typical night. Sure, listen. Give me... They'll find us thrilling. Here's a big star is going to tell you how glamorous and exciting it is at the Garner's right. household. You want to hear the whole day? Just if you Just want to hear the whole day or whatever. Well, the whole day is up, up about 5.30, 5.45. I get to see In the morning? In the morning, about 7. Uh, now, I work all day. I get home between 7.30 and 8.30. Uh-huh. 
Uh, at night, I uh, take my makeup off and have a shower, and I have dinner by somewhere around 9, 9.15. About dinner. And then, That's exciting. Got, then I have to learn about <laughs> anywhere from 11 to 10 to 15 pages of, of dialogue. Uh-huh. And then I go to sleep and I get up at 5.30 the next morning. <laughs> I do that. Boy, and you thought it was going to be It's, it's a thriller. I can't tell you. See, they were expecting it, something glamorous and exciting. I That's it. I huh? do that every day for about nine months a year. Whew. It's fun. <laughs> I, got that. I remember one thrilling night. <laughs> the traffic on the freeway was just great. It was the most exciting That was the biggest uh, thing that happened that week. You know, something I really have noticed, I have literally gone to work and never seen the sun. What I have gotten to work before the sun comes up, and I've gone home afterward and never left the stage. And they all begin never to shout. Never seen the daylight. Oh. oh. But for and that, you get... when they send me that check, I don't know. Yeah. You get almost $300 a week, don't you, for that show? Why, are you getting that much? Yeah. Didn't you know? You get almost three hundred now a week. Is that before or after? All right, now let's let's assume. All right, let's assume you're not Jim Garner. You're not doing Rockford Files. You're not well known all over the world. What would you What would you be doing? What would you rather do than this? We all complain. I mean, everybody complains about their job. That's really hard to say. I think if I found something I didn't I, I like better than what I'm doing, I'd probably do it. Mm-hmm. But I think I would like to have been one of two things if I hadn't have been an actor, and I would have been uh, either. A, professional golfer or a race driver. Yeah, I know you're about a, what, a two handicap or one handicap golfer? Oh, somewhere in there. Well, that's, that's, <laughs> that's pretty close to scratch. Now, that's, uh... Yeah, well, no, I'm about a five now. Yeah, that's, that's very tough. Because I only play about three months a year. Yeah, that's when you're not getting up at 5.30 in the morning. I don't have time to play during the working season. Yeah. Speaking of 20 years ago, weren't you, at that time, starring... In Maverick? Yep. Was it that long? 21. What? 21. 21 years ago. I mentioned that to Freddie DeCorder this afternoon. We sat there and said, no, that can't be. That was, it was 10, 12 years ago. But that was 21 years ago? 21 years ago. That does not seem possible. Oh, no, I still saw plays. one the other night. That's... That plays around, doesn't it? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, one of my... When I was watching television at 1 o'clock in the morning, uh, one of them came on the other day, and... My stand-in, who was still with me, Louis Delgado, and yeah. my stunt man, who was still with me, uh, he's as old as I am. <laughs> and uh, I saw it, I couldn't believe. We all looked like about 16-year-old kids. It was just amazing. It was a good show. Was a, that, was a, that was a darn good show. Yeah, it was for what it was, when it was. Yeah. Uh, I don't think it holds up, but at the time, it did pretty good. Yeah. Steve... Uh, Steve Allen and Ed Sullivan didn't like it too well. <laughs> that's uh, right, that I was remember. our opposition, remember? You know that's true, because I'll tell you why. I went on St- uh, Steve's show at that time. That's when Ed Sullivan's show was on. You came on, and Steve Allen had his hour variety show. And I remember, and Steve has still got the film clip. I didn't have it, and I went on. I was trying to think of a bit to do on Steve's show. I saw it, uh, yeah. And all I came up with, I said... Uh, I brought this problem up. I said, a lot of you people are watching um, maybe Ed Sullivan tonight or, or Maverick or, or Steve's show. And you'd like to see all of them. So I did. I prepared a bit with all three of you. The premise was you were playing poker with Ed Sullivan and Steve Allen. And I played all the parts. Yeah. I, I had a table set up was the bit. And I sat down and dealt the cards. I put the hat. All I had was a funny show. I couldn't do you because I didn't have the voice. But I just put the Western hat on and says, how many cards? Then a Jane seat. And... Give me two Two cards. <laughs> and then I'd get up and you'd say, and I'd put the hat quickly back on and move back into your seat and say to Steve, how many do you want, Steve? I'd get up and go over to Steve's son and, and went. <laughs> did Steve's silly laugh, went back and did the whole bit that way. I remember for you. For about five was minutes. Funny, funny skin. I had, that's right. That's why I remember you. I exactly saw it about a year ago. Uh, I think somebody Steve was, was doing a retrospective or something and he pulled that out. And I had not seen it in, well, that was 20 years ago? That was 20 years ago. Whoa. Didn't they do also... Didn't Ralph Edwards do you on oh. This Is Your Life? Do you remember This Is Your Life? Yeah. That was a hot show. That which was... at that time was live, and the recipient was not supposed to know. No, of course. I... They, they tried to trick him and uh, get him I'm, to the studio. I'm one of the few people that knew. You uh-huh. knew? <laughs> the secret is out. Yeah, by accident, I found out about it. I, I was late to work. Yeah. First time I'd ever been late to work, and uh, 
Somebody came to our door at 8 o'clock in the morning. I was supposed to be at the studio at 7, so he thought he was safe. And I, the doorbell rang, and I jumped up, and I said, my God, I'm late. So I ran in the bathroom. My wife answered the door. And Hugh Benson, who was an executive of the studio, said, well, I'm here to take care of you and the baby and everything, because today they're going to do this is your life on Jim. She and said, oh, well, I'm going to have to tell him. He says, you can't. The phones are cut off at the studio. Nobody can talk to him. You can't tell him. She said, oh, yes, I can. <laughs> Honey. <laughs> and you and I came thing. trotting out, and he just... Uh, now you had to play uh, it like you didn't know. Well, the problem of it was I refused to do it. Well, you wouldn't? Oh, no, I didn't want to do that. Uh, <laughs> but he says, you've got to. I said, I don't have to do anything. They, said, they were but what about your grandmothers? <laughs> and your mom and dad? And all your relatives and your friends have been here for five days in the hotel rehearsing. <laughs> That's where the no, voice would black come off. Mail if that's where the voice would come off stage. Hello, Jim. Yeah. You remember me? <laughs> then they'd wheel Granny out. Yeah. yeah. Half the time, the people did not want to see Grandma. There were times yeah. when they didn't want to see him. Right. Either. Oh, they did say, "Yeah, I had some." Uh, did you go through with it? Oh yeah, I had to. Of course. Uh, that show, that show must. But be it fun. was kind of fun. I put them on all day. I was absolutely terrible. Anything they wanted to do, I didn't want to do it. Uh, and Jack Kelly and uh, Jack Casey, a PR man, were uh, assigned to me to keep me busy uh, and not, you know, get there too early. There was this, it was a photography session right across the alley right. here at NBC. And I said, let's go on over there. And he said, no, let's have another drink. And I got them plastered. <laughs> Both of them were ripped. And they didn't know that you and knew all that. They didn't know that I knew it. And when they... Ralph Edwards came on and uh, did the, the whole thing. I, I, you know, what are you, how are you going to fake it? You know, so I just got angry. And I turned around and I kicked at Jack and he said, you. And it was live television. So I like, got. Like we are. Like we were. Nobody can read that. Should I said SOB? No, no, just make a difference oh, now. Okay. Uh, that's, anyway, after, I that's got, after the fact. I got back at him for... Uh, <laughs> that's funny. For, yeah, it was really weird. There was one instance, and I, I'd have to check with Ralph Edwards, and if he, if he watches it tonight, he'll probably let me know, but somebody would not go on. Who was it? And they were all ready, and he was next door, or he was in a, like in a restaurant or something, and when time got ready to bring him on... He was a brown derby. He would not... Was it Lowell Thomas? It was Lowell Thomas who would... Is that name? He, I, I don't know whether he did. No, he did go on. There was somebody who... he re really hated it. Yeah, he kicking and screaming, they drug him in. And Ralph Edwards is saying, this is your life. I don't want to go on. And it was uh, a, a great well, night. I did more or less the same thing. I, every yeah, time but you he got, every time, fun. Yeah, but every time he got maudlin, you know, they do that. Oh, yes. You know, oh, yeah, if they can get... It's Bring like on your former school teacher. Acted, and... Yeah, they brought out my old commanding officer in the Army. And uh, he, he said that I saved his life. I was wounded before he was. Oh, he didn't. Uh, I didn't save his life, and I mentioned the name of the guy that did because I happen to know about it. And but people get on there and say the weirdest things. Did you uh, point it out that you didn't save his life? Yes, I did. I oh. said there was another fellow there, wasn't there? Oh yes, yes, he was there. I don't, I don't want to mention that guy's name because I did it 20 years ago, and I just got a letter about 10 days ago about somebody who said, "Did you say this guy's name?" Oh, I see. And did I know him and whatever? And I don't want to get into that again. Yeah. That's right. I know from your autobiography. You got a, a, or your biogra biography. You got a couple of Purple Hearts during the war, didn't you? Mm, yeah. 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 Well, I didn't really get them. I got one, but they didn't give me that. I didn't really get the medal itself. Why not? I got the wounds. <laughs> well, you're supposed to get that. I made a dumb mistake when I was in the hospital with the second one. They said, do you, do you, have, you have a Purple Heart? And I said, yeah. I said, okay. They never gave me one. But uh, I've been in the line when I got the first one. Yeah. And they never actually gave me the medal. They never did. Well, why don't we get it? <laughs> I tried to get it. When I got out of the Army, they wouldn't give it to me. So you already got one. Well, we're going to take care of that. Will you come back here for the presentation? No. Well, now, now I'm mad. I won't. Well, no. I was lucky the first time the uh, North Koreans shot me. The second time the, uh, our own Navy did. <laughs> Well, they're dangerous. Would you want to tell me about that? Because I was in the Navy. I can understand that happening. There was a Navy, there was a Navy Panther jet pilot. Yes? Yes. <laughs> and they're dangerous because, you know, we got better weapons. Yeah. <laughs> they can really hurt you. 
Uh, they got me... Well, how do you say it? I don't want to get bleeped again. Uh, well, you mean the location? Well, we're fighting the North Koreans. I was going south. Does that help? <laughs> they... Right in the... Right in the old kazoo. Oh. What it was is I dove in a foxhole and uh, <laughs> I went head first. That's right. I'm such an inviting target. He probably yeah. just says, hey, let's practice. Well, it was hard to miss. <laughs> Weird story. Let me take a break. We're coming right back after this. My next guest, I'm sure you all know, she is a... She's truly a fine actress. Mm, you've worked... You said you haven't... It'll be interesting when she comes out yes. until her last time you worked together, but she recently starred in the film Dream of Passion with Melina McCurry and her brand-new film, which opened last week in Los Angeles and New York, is called Same Time Next Year, also starring <coughs> Ellen Alda. Would you welcome, please, Ellen Burstyn. Ellen... doesn't know, Doc. How we are you? We know each other. We can kiss. Yes, you can yes. kiss. That's it. That's, that's Do you know acceptable. how we know each other? Jim just mentioned I was backstage. He said, gee, I'm glad Ellen's on the show tonight. And he says, I've worked with her. And I figured, well, it was like last week or something, you know, because yeah. everybody thinks in this business that everybody knows everybody else. But you had worked with him before, but you tell him when. 18 years ago. <laughs> I know that because it was, uh, it was just when you finished um, Maverick. Uh, yeah, I was having a lawsuit at the time. Yes. <laughs> And, uh, and I know it was before my son was born, and he's 17 now, so it had to be at least 18 years ago. What did you work together on? We, we did a play called John Loves Mary in Summerstock. We toured, I think, three cities. He was so popular at that time that it took him an hour and a half to get out of the theater at night. He had to sign all the autographs for everybody who came to the, you know, would do those tent shows, like uh -huh. for 2,000 people. And we had connecting dressing rooms, and the people would file in my dressing room and out his. <laughs> they never uh -huh. stop and ask for my autograph. They're just on the way, is this way to Mr. Gardner's? That's yes. a television exposure, you know, that instantaneous recognition. Mm -hmm. Jim said he has not seen you, That's I don't right. think, since that time. That's right. We have not seen each other in 18 years. Well, you know, in this business, we're all very close. <laughs> I could, but that's a kind of a misconception. That's a myth that all entertainers know each other well, and uh, like we have a cookout at each other's house every night. And Jim and I had a jammy party last week, but outside of that, nothing. Everywhere I go, when I meet people who aren't in the business and they assume that I know everybody in the business, what they want to know is, what's John and Carson really like? What are you going to say? Because we don't know each other well. That's right. We've met, but uh, that, that, that's kind of a myth. Say, same time next year is a wonderful play. Thank you. I, I, it's, uh, and I've read some great reviews on it. For the people who do not know, because we have a small film clip, you, you want to fill them in on what it's about? It's about a couple who meet at a resort initially. It's a couple who meet at a resort uh, accidentally. She's on her way to a religious retreat, and he's uh, out of town uh, for doing business. And they're both married, account. right? And they're both married and have families, and they meet and they have an affair. Uh, that weekend and they decide that they want to stay married and they they love their spouses but they also care for each other so they make a date to meet at the same place uh, once a year and so the picture covers 25 years uh, just their meeting each weekend I mean for one weekend <laughs> each year it's a great premise years. yeah and you cover it in a series of what about five-year intervals or something like that they're four five, five. Intervals. yeah and uh, it, it's wonderful because it's sort of a a history of America and what we've been through in the last uh, 25 years. So, I mean, as I was doing it, I remembered all of the changes that I've gone through. Because you did it originally on yes. Broadway. Yeah. And now you did the movie. Was it like, uh, after you've been away from apart for a while, was it like coming back to something very familiar or...? Well, yes, except I had a new boyfriend. That's right. So, uh, was Chuck Roden in the... Uh, it, Chuck Roden was the original George, and Alan Alda is uh, in the film. And uh, so it was like having a... You know, a new love affair. Yeah, that is strange because the character, uh, when I saw it, would, would change because you go through the, uh, the Berkeley, the, uh, the, the radical 60s, and you see the people's attitudes and changes, and it says a lot. Yeah. And it's kind of a fantasy, I suppose, for a lot of people to fantasize about something. Everybody can identify with that kind of a, yeah. of a story. I don't know. I'd have, do you think you could get away with that? Once, oh. once a, for a weekend, once a year? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> Hmm. But everybody fantasizes about that, right? Now, how about you? 
No, I don't know. The, the guilt <laughs> feelings might... Uh, I'm sorry, no. I didn't make, no, no. make you stutter. No, you didn't make me stutter. <laughs> uh, what but, would you say, I mean, just, you know, in, in fantasy now, if you, if you did make such an arrangement, what excuse would you give to your wife? Oh, you deny. Oh, you always deny. Uh-huh. Don't you remember the uh, Italian movie, the love, divorce, Italian style or something, where uh, the wife came in and he's in bed with a girl and denies it right there. <laughs> of course. And he turned it around and he accused her. He says, you're not supposed to be back until Friday. And she'd come back on a Thursday. And he turned it around and made her very guilty. He says, don't you trust me? You said you weren't coming back till Friday. And it was wonderful. He just kept denying. And there he was, right there. I don't think that would work, though. No. no. Can you, can you uh, relate to this kind of a, uh, well, a uh, fantasy? I, I must say that uh, it seems to me that the institution of marriage in this country uh, is built on the idea of uh, fidelity. But it would be nice if we knew how much fidelity there really is, wouldn't it? Mm. <laughs> mm. Maybe it's better we don't. We're going to come back. We'll show you a film clip. I don't know which particular segment this is, uh, but we'll find out. We'll do this first. Then I'm going to get your re- reaction to this, Jim. Sure. Sitting over there, Mr. Smart. We just talked about making pictures of how difficult it is because one thing I like about television, you ask me if I, did, you know, are we going to do a picture or something? You want to think about television, you get an immediate feedback. It's like working a live show. You're either good or bad, and you know immediately. When you make a picture sometimes, six months later until the picture is out, you're not sure whether uh, the way it's going to be put together is the way you, you envisioned it when you did it and That's how it'll be re- uh, received by the audience and the critics. Yeah. And uh, this has come out very well, though, I understand. Yes, uh, the audiences really seem to love it. What segment now of your uh, extracurricular... Uh, Activities are we going to see the first meeting, the second five years, the? Uh... Uh, I understand it's the uh, the first meeting, the the morning after. Morning after, as we <laughs> diplomatically call it. Okay, watch the monitor. Looking outfit. <clears throat> what time is it? My watch is on the bed table. <sighs> Ten to twelve? No, no, it's eight twenty-five. The stem is broken. It's three hours and twenty-five minutes fast. <laughs> Why don't you get it fixed? I was going to, but I got used to it. Doesn't it mix you up? No, I'm very quick with figures. Oh. Why are you looking at me like that? Why do you have to look so luminous? I mean, it would make things so much easier if you woke up with puffy eyes and blotchy skin like everyone else. Guess God just figured that chubby thighs were enough. Look, this isn't going to just go away. We have to talk about this. Okay. Where are you going? I want to brush my teeth. So that's the way it is, huh? It's right. well, so wondered. much better looking at that than uh, when I was on the show with Don Denver while you were away. Right. I was, uh, we looked at a clip of Dream of Passion, and I couldn't look at it because it was so 
Uh, ugly. <laughs> so it was. It was nice to be able to see a, a nice, happy. Uh, yeah, that, that's that's lovely. Well, are you able to watch yourself uh, uh, critically without? Uh, most actors or actresses are not. They say they look at it and they say, "Oh, I could have done this a little better. I could have had a little nuance here, maybe a little different look." Or you say, "Once it's done, it's done. And you've done your best, and that's it." Well, I I always look at the dailies. I look at each day's work, and uh, and I'm pretty objective about that. Uh, but then after it's over and it's all cut together, when I sit with an audience, then I always feel real cringy and embarrassed. So I, I only see it once. And, uh, and then sometimes after it's been playing, I'll sneak into a neighborhood theater and... To get a and, reading on it? And just watch the audience. Then. Just since I caught Mel Brooks doing that once, I went to see Blazing Saddles, and I came out of the, the theater, and, I, and there was Ann and Mel standing in the back of the theater like he's rooting the crowd on. He just wanted to get it. You know, he says, hey, that's a great picture. I thought it was one of the ushers standing there. He just ducked into the picture to see what the reaction was, which is, not, which is not a bad way to do it. Well, it's a good way, you know, only the audience can tell you whether or not In the long run. doing what you yeah. mean to be doing. You know? I asked Jim this question. What would you do? Is, is, acting, obviously, is very important to you. You're very mm -hmm. skilled at it. If you hadn't become an actress, what, uh, what kind of life do you think you'd, you'd want to lead? Um, if, if, you know, if tomorrow you couldn't act, and says, okay, you've got a second choice now. Well, I'd love to go to the moon. Or anywhere else in outer space. Mm. Uh, so I don't know if I'd qualify for an astronaut, but... I, I think they have ladies in training now. Uh-huh. Yeah, sure. Um, but I'm still acting, so I, I'm <laughs> not to that. Well, when that's true, we'll book the moon. <laughs> you know, we have theaters there, so who knows? We'll take a short break. We'll be right back. Thank you, Tom. We're talking to Ellen Burson and Jim Garner. My next guest is a young performer, a comedian who was a regular on the recent Mary Tyler Moore variety series. He appears regularly here in town, here in town at the Comedy Store and uh, will be hosting the Rose Bowl Parade for television on the 1st of January. Would you welcome, please, David Letterman. David. Thank you, thank you, thank you. How many of you folks here have never been to a TV studio before? Applaud if you've never been to one of these things. Okay. How many of you, how many of you have been here before? Applaud if you have been here before. Okay. All right, now, how many of you who have never been here before today are here with somebody who has been here before? Applaud. Okay, now, listen carefully. This gets a little confusing at this point, huh? How many of you out of that last group are in this country illegally? Could we just hear? <laughs> Great, fine. Looking for yard work, I'll bet. Well, nice to have you here. <laughs> I, uh, I just got back into the United States. I was in Canada, and I flew back a couple of days ago. I flew one of those uh, bargain flights, 99 bucks one way, and uh, uh, literally no bargain. You know, it's hundreds of drooling indigents fighting over tubs of gruel in the aisle of the plane. And Immigrants and people who haven't been vaccinated looking over bad fruit and stuff, so... I get up and I go to the lavatory of the aircraft and there's this enormous sign above the toilet that says, Do not place metal or glass objects in the toilet. Now, that always ruins a trip for me. I, uh... <laughs> I like to go back there, wash a load of dishes in it, you know. <laughs> now, here's something you can do. If you get bored on a flight, like a three or four hour flight, here's something you can do to always amuse yourself. Wait till the person in the seat next to you falls asleep. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> then what you do, you reach over, get their attention. Maybe get them around the throat, give them one of these. <laughs> and then you say something like, well, I guess we're going to find out now if these seat cushions really do float, huh? <laughs> Fast and furious. I, uh, I, anyway, I'm back in town, and uh, my car is still not functioning properly, so I got a hitchhike and stuff. Took it in a week and a half ago for a minor tune-up, 35 bucks, and the guy says to me what they always say. He says, uh, is there a telephone number where we can get a hold of you later today? You know, if we find anything else wrong with the car. <laughs> Invariably, they find something else wrong with the car. Two, day, two days later, the guy calls up, and he says, uh, yeah, Mr. Letterman? <clears throat> oh, uh, listen, uh... <laughs> You know, uh, we was resetting the buttons on your radio, and, uh... Yeah, your damn engine exploded. 
Tore it up pretty bad, killed one of our boys. Now, let's see, that'll be a little more than... So anyway, what I got to do, I, for instance, I had to hitchhike over here this evening, and uh, this guy stops and picks me up. He's driving an old beat-up Dodge with a bent frame. You know, they kind of go down the freeway at, a, at an angle like that. And... <laughs> the windshield on the right-hand side of the car is missing. It's just gone, busted out. And the back seat is on fire. Well, right away, I'm apprehensive about getting in, you know? The, the guy driving the car is wearing a cowboy hat and a hospital gown, see? So... <laughs> And uh, he's rolling, the thing that bothers me most of all about him, he's rolling the biggest joint I'd ever seen in my entire life. He was using Pampers, and uh... <laughs> Just awful, we, uh... Sat, uh, we sat at an intersection for a half an hour waiting for a stop sign to change, so it was, uh... Anyway, I, I came over here tonight, and we're watching the news a little bit, and I learned something uh, just incredible. The, the most popular newspaper in the entire world now is one of those things you buy at the checkout counter of the uh, grocery stores, you know? And uh, the headlines in that thing today, just incredible. How to lose weight without diet or exercise. <laughs> Pretty much leaves disease, doesn't it? You know, when you, when you get right down to... <laughs> I was able to lose over 60 pounds without diet or exercise. What's my secret? Well, I was lucky enough to be seriously ill for a year and a half. I... <laughs> it's, pretty, it's pretty surprising to me that you learn anything on uh, local news anymore, anymore because it's all feature-oriented, you know? You don't have any hard news. And uh, they're two- and three-hour newscasts, so they load it up with a lot of stuff you don't care about. And you hear things like, no more oxygen for planet Earth. Well, we'll get to that story a little later if we have time for it. But Right now, Arlene has a fascinating feature report about your cat's number one problem. <laughs> Fur balls. Arlene? Thank you. <clears throat> How many times have you and the members of your family been scared silly because you heard your cat make this noise? Thank you, Arlene, for that fascinating in-depth study. First of a 12-part series here on Eyewitness News. So. I used to, uh, I used to work for the Eyewitness News uh, station uh, back in Indiana where I lived, and... Uh... Thank you. Folks hoping to win a prize for that, I'll bet, huh? Uh, <laughs> so... And uh, the, the concept of eyewitness news, you know, make it as funny as you possibly can. So one day there were three murders in the city, and the news director didn't think it would be real amusing to have the anchorman report all three of these murders back to back. So they gave one to the sportscaster to do, see? And the guy is reading baseball scores at the time. Well, first in the National League, it was the Mets over the Braves, three to two. Reds got past the cards, five to four, and the Dodgers murdered the Giants, nine to nothing. Speaking of murders... <laughs> Looks like 45-year-old Eddie Poster won't be going out to the old ballpark anymore. <laughs> no, Eddie was gunned down last night during a liquor store holdup. Once again, that final score, liquor store one, Eddie nothing. <laughs> a joint in Pampers. Yeah. I like that. Like that. We'll do this. We'll be right back. <laughs> We're back. We're talking to David Letterman. You know, that's very funny stuff. Thank that's new and it's fresh and everything. Um, I saw you on Mary's uh, variety show, and you're excellent at that. Have you done a lot of television? No, I have, uh, well, that was only on, uh, like, three weeks. Right. And uh, so people don't uh, recognize me much for that day. I used to work at an adult bookstore. I get recognized a lot. Yeah. That. But, uh, <laughs> uh, I'd done a couple of things. I was on a show two weeks ago, the, uh, the Battle of the Network Stars, you know. That's right. That's a silly show. You know, to me, it's... Uh, 
I don't care, you know. So what if Debbie Boone can do more push-ups than I can? I, you know, it's not one of your top priorities in no. life, I don't assume. No. I've done some commercial work. or turned, turned some down. You have to be very careful. Yeah. Um, they called me up and they said, we got a product here. Why, you folks probably got it. Like an electric bird bath, right? Everybody's got one. <laughs> Yeah. Well, what they do, they heat up the water in the morning when you're, so your bird doesn't catch cold out there. Sure. Take it back. So I, I researched this thing, and I went down there, and the guy said that the thing worked perfectly, but they were getting a lot of complaints because people weren't reading instructions, and the birds were getting electrocuted. <laughs> and he said they got over 500 letters of complaint from people who had their birds die on them, but out of all of those people that wrote in, not one of them. Not one of them ever took the trouble to put the little rubber safety boots on the bird before they put it into the water. So, it's their fault. Yeah, absolutely. They should not, the no. company should not be held accountable for no. that. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're from Indiana. Did you work in local uh, radio and uh, yeah, television I did, in the uh, West? Yeah, I did. I'm from Indiana, and I guess we had folks from South Bend here, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a, it's beautiful there. What a, what a town. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I used to work in, you know, the one thing I'll never, well, ever, this happens to everybody, that the kind of thing I'll always remember as long as I live, growing up in Indiana, is when Dad used to tease me with the power tools. How many of you, <laughs> did you have that? <laughs> what a guy, what a guy. Sense of humor. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> I'll never. <laughs> yeah, he, uh... <laughs> Chase you around the house with a belt sander. Come yeah. <laughs> Get your attention real yeah, quick, yeah. <laughs> Come from a funny family. I just, I just asked Dave, you've been working at the comedy store, and I said, how's it going? You said, well, you'd be, rather be working other places for, for real money. Yeah, the comedy store is a yeah. great place to go. You get an audience, and you, you work out new right. material. I've been there for three years, and... Uh, uh, <laughs> and uh, but after a while, you get the itch to go out and, and earn some dough, so... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, it's a wonderful place to work. I... Uh, uh, so I, I'm hoping, hoping to get out a little more. I worked yeah. a couple of dates in Baltimore with uh, Tony Orlando. That's an interesting... Tony Orlando, you wouldn't think he gets an older audience, yeah. you know? You, you open the auditorium and you don't smell popcorn and you s smell Vicks, so you know that it's going to be... They have hymns on the Muzak that they have to turn down before the show starts off. <laughs> but I could always go back to uh, local broadcasting. Yeah. I, I did a lot of that. I, uh, Newscaster? Or, uh, yeah. Right. We used to have, it was the local eyewitness news team, and uh, the, my favorite part of the broadcasting day was always the uh, station editorials. Because you gotta remember one thing, you can't be very controversial. Yeah. They always pretend to be so controversial, but they never can. Secondly, it gives the station manager the opportunity that he doesn't often get at coming on TV. And so this guy would come out, and he always looked good, had on about a $4 suit and an $8 toupee, you know, and uh, <laughs> made out of the same stuff. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, this guy would come out and he'd say something like, Channel 13 would like to take this opportunity to say that we are diametrically opposed to the practice of using orphans as yardage markers at driving ranges. We're just... <laughs> you can't fall the man no, like that. No, you really can't. <laughs> I have a feeling from your shot on this show tonight, you're going to be working a lot outside the comedy store. Thank you. Really, I hope you come back with us. I'd love to. Yeah. Thank you very much. We'll be right back. Boy, out in a hospital gown? Okay. My next guest has been with us once before. He's a former traffic officer who's written a book called The Ticket Book. And it's a driver's manual, I guess, for avoiding tickets and what to do after you get one and if you go to court or how to avoid going to court and et cetera. Would you welcome Rod Dornside? Rod? You had a whole spread here in today's Herald Tribune. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, well, what do you mean, no kidding? Like I haven't you even did, seen you that. You didn't know that? This is all about you. It's out of the Tribune is out of this. I said the Tribune, did I? <laughs> they haven't published the Tribune since 1905 here. <laughs> the Herald Examiner was what I met. I was recently in one of those uh, grocery store publications. Yeah. Well, that uh, David was talking about? Right, and so I thought, oh, now I've made a big time when they're saying bad things about me in the grocery store. As soon as they start knocking you, you're ahead of the yeah. game. That's right. How many tickets as a traffic officer did you, did you ever issue? Do you have any idea? I didn't keep count, of course, but uh, uh, an average traffic officer in his career will write somewhere around 70,000. You said that, you said in this article, out of the 2.4 million are issued by the California Highway Patrol each year, 
And uh, there are only 14 million licensed drivers out here, right? Right. So that means about every third person. Well, there's more than that because the 2.4 million are only the CHP or California Highway Patrol. You uh, forgot all about the city and about county. About the local and, police and so yeah, forth. Yeah, there's 6.3 million issued each year in California. And so you stop and think about it. That's almost one out of two people. Let's check. You ever get a ticket out here, David? Uh, I got a shoebox full of them. Shoebox. All right, Ellen, you ever get a ticket here? One. Jim? Doc, you're already on record. <laughs> I think he gave me one. So there's, there's four of you right here. Now, I have not received one in California yet. You're next. I've been out. <laughs> but you're out of business now, right? That's true. Okay. That's true. I'm driving down the highway. I see the cops by. I see those red lights, mm -hmm. which immediately is like Jaws 2, right? You, right. you panic. <laughs> what should you do? You pull over. How should you act? What are some of the do's and don'ts for people? Should you admit guilt immediately? Definitely not. Definitely some, not. Now, that's oh, interesting. No. Some people really stick their neck out. You know, they, they want to come on very remorseful, very honest, and say, Officer, you know, I know I was going 90 miles right. an hour, but there's a reason. And uh, the officer, while, while you're saying this, is sometimes taking notes. And certainly, if he's not taking notes, he'll write it down on his copy later. And right. you, you'll forget that, that he's taken the trouble to, to write notes. And when you get in court, you've changed your mind about your, your guilt by that time, of course. Uh -huh. And you get in court... And all of a sudden, he turns his copy of the ticket over, and he says, Do you remember when you said... I was going 90, I was going miles, 90 hour. miles an hour. And it's awful embarrassing. Right. Is there any way to keep the officer from starting to write the ticket? Yes. Uh, the thing to do is engage him in conversation. Of course, if, uh, <laughs> if he stopped you before, you know, comment on how much weight he's lost or something. <laughs> something like, good. That's good. Something that'll really get his attention. That would start talking before he starts writing. The officer, on the other hand, does the same thing with you, to, you know, the motorist to keep them from trying to talk him out of it. I mean, like, when I would go up to the car, and I'd say, oh, this is a really fine car you have. Let me see your driver's license. And talk about his car, ask him where he works, ask him where he's going, what he's had for dinner, right. who the girl is next to him, right. whatever. Mm -hmm. yeah. How many, what percentage of tickets that are given out are worth, say, going to court? I would say about 30% of them. Really worth going to court? Oh, yes. yes. Why? Well, you know, the problem is the officer's out there every day, and, and uh, not many people fight him. It's very, very inconvenient. Because you have to show up somewhere. Right. It's, it's very intimidating. But he has to show up too, doesn't he? Well, not the first time around. The first time right. around is an arraignment. And right. then if you schedule a trial, then, of course, he has to show up. But he gets paid for it. And so when you really look at it, a bad officer could actually make more money uh, because he's getting paid overtime than an officer that's doing a good job. So in case if you think it's unfair, mm -hmm. uh, you, you should really try to Most get it off your record. That's right. Now, what would be unfair? Suppose I get a radar thing. Now, that happens. You always see these things, radar ahead. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, like with radar, there's a lot of things that can affect it. Uh, for example, if you were driving by and you had a, a CB in your car, yeah. and when you were to key down the microphone and you're going to tell the guy behind you, of course, about this radar trap ahead, right. you could cause a reading on the radar. You could be going 55 and the reading could be 75. And it's picking up your CB transmission. So what you're saying, they can make mistakes on that. That's right. There's some errors that can crop up with radar. Do officers like that if you say, I'm going to fight this or I'm going to go to court? Doesn't well, that make them a little thing, hostile? Well, the best thing to do at the scene, bear in mind, this is his situation. He's, he's calling the numbers and he's controlling yeah. it. So if you try to get into a verbal contest with him or, or, or try to argue the, the merits of the citation, you're going to lose, lose. So just try to blend into the crowd. You know, remember, he writes thousands and thousands of tickets. <laughs> try to be Mr. Average. Just don't say a thing. Go along with whatever he has to say. Yes, sir. No, sir. And go on your way. And he won't remember you. What about these things I see advertised now about uh, radar uh, you can put in your car that lets you know if there's a radar thing ahead? Are those legal? Right. That's the fuzzbuster type yeah. radar detectors, right? Yeah, they tell uh, you when you're coming to a radar control zone. They're legal in all states except Virginia. But in Virginia, they had a recent uh, situation where the, the guts of the law, in essence, was overturned by a Supreme Court ruling uh, where, whereby they said not only do you have to possess one to, to be guilty, but you have to possess it for an unlawful purpose. And it has to be in use, and it has to be in use for an unlawful purpose. So you can see is how that difficult a, Is that an unlawful purpose? If you have one in your car, they'll let you know that there's a radar? Well, theoretically, so. yes, but there's so many, uh, there are some lawful reasons for it. Well, could you it. say you're looking for enemy planes? They're not going to buy that. <laughs> no. You know, you can't say the Germans may attack. I'm carrying this in a car. What, uh... Well, you know, they, uh, some truckers have argued, I know in Alaska, they use radar detectors to uh, find delivery points. Right. Uh, they'll broadcast with a radar beam, and the truckers will home in with their, with their radar units, yeah. radar detectors. What happens if somebody gets, now this, you know, how much of this goes on? Guy gives you his license, and under the license is, a, say, a $20 bill or 
a fifty dollar bill. Not as much as it used to. Yeah. Uh, there, uh, ten years ago, that California, was, I know, is very tough. Oh, in the West, yeah. uh, you know, you'll go to jail just right now if you if you drive that. But I know I heard a story the other day where uh, a guy was telling about how easy it was, and how clever way he had. And what he did is, when the officer came up to the window, he'd hold up a ten dollar bill, and he says, "I'll bet you ten dollars you're going to give me a ticket." And the cop takes the ten dollars and says, "You lose." And walks up. <laughs> Won't, won't try that anymore, I guess. We got a 55-mile speed limit around the country, all over now, federal. People obviously are not observing it. If you've been on any freeway at all, if you drive 55, you are going to get rear-ended by practically 95 or 99 percent of the drivers, because the average speed is very close to 60 now. At least. Do you think it's a good idea to keep that, because the, the highway patrol gives people 60, or was it 65 that give them 70? Well, that's, you Just know, personally, what do you think? I, I don't think the 55-mile-an-hour speed limit is realistic. It's not realistic. And traffic engineers, time and time will, again, will tell you, don't post a limit that is unrealistic because the people won't follow it. And you have a better chance of keeping them in line if you post a, a limit that's, uh, that's realistic. The people will say, okay, 65 is all right. And Abe Lincoln once said, he said, the best way to get a bad law repealed is enforce it strictly. And that's exactly, I think, what's going to happen with the 55. That's interesting. You think it'll go out of existence? Uh, with time. All right. We'll take a break. We'll be right back. You're nailed on the highway. This might might help. Won't get you out of court, but it might. Thanks, Rod, for being here. Oh, thank you. David, thanks. It was a great pleasure. I thank hope you come back much. with us. Thank it you. It was a great spot. <laughs> Ellen, of course, is in the same time next year, which is open in New York and Los Angeles already, and I assume around the rest of the country very soon. Very soon. I hope it's a big hit for you. Thanks for being thank here. Thank you. Thank you, James. Thank you. See you at the next pleasant party. Monday night, Don Rickles will be here with Glenn Campbell, Elkie Sommer, Ann Landers, and Artie and Gisela Johnson. Thank you. Have a nice weekend. I'm humbled by that applause.
Xin chào tất cả mọi người Và hôm nay bên em lại về một chiếc xe Hyundai Asian Xe sản xuất 2021 Bản 1.4 số tự động Xe phiên bản màu đỏ Xe này là xe tiêu chuẩn Không phải là xe bản đặc biệt Vì vậy nó không có cửa lóc mọi người nhé Và em sẽ quay tổng thể chiếc xe này cho mọi người cùng xem Bên em mới về thôi Con xe này thì giá rẻ hơn giá thị trường vài chục triệu Bởi vì nó bị cũng bị vào quyền một chút Đấy Đó, mọi người có thể thấy là tổng thể chiếc xe còn rất mới mới đi được chưa được một năm và mới chỉ nóng máy thôi tuy nhiên đã phụ nữ nái là nó hơi quẹt một chút các bạn nhìn thấy nốt la răng này tay nắm cửa mở gro sinh nhật tích hợp nói chung là rất nhìn rất là nét về trên mưa ốc uh, chrome này. xe thì biểu tượng hyundai rất đẹp xe màu đỏ số tự động thích hợp cho cả phụ nữ và đàn ông đều đi được số tự động rất là dễ dàng Đấy. Asen và tay nắm cửa thì mã Chrome rô bốn quả lốp thì mới cứng mọi chi tiết của em nó là gần như mới gần như ở trong các showroom ra nhé Đấy, các bạn có thể thấy rằng là mua về chỉ việc đi thôi va quẹt nhưng nó không va quẹt quá lặng không vào sắt xi và cũng không bung túi khí không gì cả nó chỉ bị ở phần sườn thôi mọi người nhé đèn này rất là đẹp và sáng xe này gần như là mới gần như là mới mua ở showroom về Đấy, và em sẽ quay nội thất trong người cùng xem đây hàng ghế trước DVD tích hợp kem nồi vô lăng cần số mọi chi tiết của em nó ra ghế rất mới tuy nhiên thì em này thì vừa mới đi về khả năng chưa dọn dẹp nhiều đó, hàng ghế sau thì cũng rất là mới xe thì có trang bị điều hòa sau rồi mà mọi thứ rất là mới nhé và nói chung là không, không phải xem quá nhiều vì nó còn này bị va phần sườn chứ không phải va ở phần ở phần vào ăn vào sắt xi là không nên là cũng không phải xem quá nhiều Đấy, tổng thể chiếc xe đã quay rất là kỹ rồi Mọi người thấy như nào Còn uh, xe thì uh, ai mua thì liên hệ trực tiếp Với em, có số điện thoại thì em đã để trên góc màn hình rồi Còn nếu mà em free một phần bình luận đã bán mà xe đã bán rồi thì không còn nữa đâu nhé Vì vậy là các bạn cứ chốt đến xem trực tiếp Nếu chốt được thì sẽ chốt Còn nếu mà không thì để cho người khác Vì là em bán xe bán xe nỗi thì cũng rất nhiều khách quen người ta mua về để người ta bán cho vùng dân tộc vùng núi giá thì rẻ ra thị trường là cái điều chắc chắn bởi vì là nó nhiều tùy vào cái độ nỗi của xe nó nặng hay nó nhẹ giá như con này là cũng nhẹ thì vậy là giá nó rất là ưu đãi thôi con này thì giá của hiện tại của em nó đang là 420 triệu không thể rẻ hơn được nữa ba rút hồ sơ đấy mọi người có xem cho kỹ nếu mọi người mà lấy được thì sẽ để lại bình luận hoặc là liên hệ trực tiếp với em Còn nếu mà em ghi đã bán là sẽ không còn nữa đâu ASEAN là một trong những dòng mà phân khúc hạng B cạnh tranh trực tiếp với Toyota Vios Tuy nhiên là em thích ASEAN hơn bởi vì là form dáng em thấy hay hơn và giá thành rẻ hơn Anh mua đến lại sớm em 420 triệu Xin chào tất cả mọi người
Thank you.